Um, I'm very excited about today's topic. I think uh, um, it's going to be a wonderful conversation. We are expecting her to take uh, 30, 35 minutes of uh, rounds. And uh, Daphne and I will be posing some questions from here. And then we will open for questions from the audience. Welcome. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that um, introduction. Let's see, maybe I'll get rid of this. It's great to be here today and see some familiar faces and new faces as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of the work that I've been doing for the past few years, looking at women's status and reproductive and maternal health in South Asia. All right, so broadly my body of work focuses on understanding how experiences across women's lives um, impact their health and the health of their children. And so, you know, this kind of, just a little image to get us thinking about what a woman's life is like in the context that I'm working in, which is mostly um, in India and Nepal. So someone might be born, go through childhood, often experiences marriage. Marriage is fairly common in these parts of the world. That usually happens fairly young age, transitions into adulthood, um, often experiences one or two or more pregnancies, and then continues throughout their, their life course. So I'm interested in how these experiences across women's lives impact their health outcomes. You know, so we can think about layering onto her experiences, how care seeking, nutrition in, in infancy and childhood and into adolescence impact her health, her use of maybe family planning to delay or space or limit the number of births she has, her overall nutrition, eating practices throughout this period of adolescence and into adulthood, the quality of care she might get as she may become pregnant, um, deliver, and into subsequent pregnancy or throughout her life outside of pregnancy. And then within all of that, I really think about how gender inequality impacts her access to all of these types of experiences of food, of care, of access to services. Um, and there's gender inequality, there's gender norms, and these might lead to things like violence or just the stress of being uh, a woman in the settings that I'm focusing in. And then of course, there's also other factors that interact with care and health, environmental exposures, structural factors, household socioeconomic status that you guys probably think about a lot in your classes. So this is kind of a framing for how I'm looking at the populations I'm working in and improving health. So South Asia um, is home to about a quarter of the world's children. And yet 50% of the world's wasted children, which is a measure of poor nutritional status, live in Asia. And so this has sort of been is a, a question, a conundrum as to why we would expect, you know, why it is that children in South Asia have higher rates of scenting and wasting and poor outcomes. There's also higher rates of preterm birth and other adverse birth outcomes in other low and middle income regions. This is also the part of the world that has the highest rates of child marriage and the lowest indicators of women's status and empowerment globally. And I'm interested in sort of the intersection, the nexus between these two factors. So, you know, the early marriage leads to early childbearing, which is associated with poor maternal and child health outcomes. So that's one of the pathways that we are looking at here. And aside from health, of course, women delaying their first birth has other impacts on women's lives. So it can help them remain in schools, maybe have more labor force or job opportunities later in life or meet other life goals or aspirations that they might have outside of just um, having children. And of course, women's low status throughout their life course, if we think back on that first um, or that second graph um, image I showed you, uh, puts them at risk of poor health, um, which in turn impacts the health of their children. So there's a cyclical effect of women's experiences and how that impacts their children. So focusing in on Nepal and thinking about these factors, um, which is the, I'm going to be talking about some research from Nepal today. So the average age of marriage in Nepal is about 18, um, and 50% of women are pregnant within one year of marriage. And this is pretty similar to India, where I also do a lot of work. So most women get pregnant pretty quickly in marriage. Co-residence is common. So this is where women live with their husband's families um, soon after marriage. So um, although this does change somewhat as couples 
get older, usually early in marriage, um, young brides move in with their husband's families. And we know that newly married women are the lowest status in their households, so they have little decision-making power, lack of access to health care, they're often the last to eat in the household, and I'm going to be talking about these things a little bit more um, uh, further on in the presentation, and that there's a pressure, or there's been sort of this perception of a pressure to bear children as soon as possible, which we see in that statistic of most women becoming pregnant within the first year of marriage. So the impetus for my research is really bringing this all together. So we know that women's status in their households and communities is low broadly in South Asia, associated with poor reproductive maternal and child health outcomes. We know that early in marriage, women have especially low status. They're young, there's co-residence, often arranged marriages in this setting. And yet most interventions wait to intervene until pregnancy. So this is problematic because of late pregnancy care seeking and also that the preconception period is key to improving health and also neglected, right? So we are interested in improving maternal child health and yet we're often, you know, waiting to really start providing services and target focusing on women until they become pregnant. And often in people don't seek pregnancy, um, prenatal care until about four months uh, in pregnancy. And it's too late at that time often to really improve maternal health and really have impacts on child health outcomes. And we also know that Im improving women's health outside of just her ability to become pregnant should be a priority. So I was really interested in if the time of marriage might be an opportune period to really promote healthy patterns rather than trying to behave changers, change behaviors and dynamics a few years into marriage, right? So by waiting until pregnancy, we already, people have been married, they've already created relationships within their households, they already have set patterns set, women's status, you know, might be, you know, how decisions are made in the household or the role women have in their household might be already set. And so asking women and their households to change these behaviors a few years into marriage kind of seemed like it was an unfair ask to them, rather than starting earlier and thinking about as relationships are forming, when the newly married woman is moving into a new household, building relationships with her husband, her in-laws, Maybe that's a better time to start thinking about improving women's status, both before she gets pregnant, but early on in this like life course trajectory of what's going to be her household for the rest of her um, her life. And then, of course, this would have added benefits for women and children broadly, even outside of health. So, with that in mind, um, I was fortunate to receive a grant from the NIH to study these factors in newly married women. Um, and so this was a five-year study in one district of Nepal. And this district is right on the uh, border of India. So it's very similar to Uttar Pradesh, uh, northern, that kind of part of India, not the like mountainy part of Nepal. Um, and so this research was focused on understanding. We know very little about the experiences of newly married women. We know very little about how their status and health interact in those first few years of marriage. And then I was interested in developing, thinking about developing approaches to support that. So I'm gonna talk about all this data sort of together, but um, there was an initial qualitative phase where we interviewed the newly married women and their husbands and their mother-in-laws together, uh, not together, but triads separately <laughs> analyzed together. And um, then we did a longitudinal study with a cohort of newly married women who we followed for two years. And what the last round of that was actually after the COVID pandemic had happened. So we were able to ended up doing some interesting studies where we had longitudinal data pre-COVID and post or into COVID. Um, and then we, working very closely with our community partners and my local research partners, developed an pilot that could have been So we found that newly married women had very low status in their households. So uh, early in marriage, 70% reported eating last of at least one type of food um, after moving into their husband's home. And this was higher than what, how often they ate last in their uh, natal home, in their parents' home. So we asked them this question right after they had gotten married. About 50 um, reported, oh, sorry. First was 70% eating less of at least one type of food. And then 50% reported always or usually eating last in the household. And this didn't really change over time. So over the two years, that was about stable. Women had very limited mobility early in marriage. 50, about 50% 50 hadn't left the house since they'd gotten married. And even since they got married and even 18 months post-marriage, 30% um, you know, reported they weren't allowed to leave the village on their own. So relationship quality, um, this showed some graphs about intimate partner violence and couples relationships. So experiences of 
violence for both the husband and other household members increased over time from about 25% at baseline to even just a year later, be about 51% of women reporting any type of form of violence from their husband, and this was about 40% um, from other household members in their husband's home. In terms of couples' relationship quality, we saw that it was poor and decreased over time. So at a year, you know, uh, about a quarter, fifth of women were reporting that they regretted that they married, they felt like they couldn't trust their husband, that they didn't feel like their husband could treat them fairly, um, and their husband couldn't be counted on for help. So, you know, we saw that the women were experiencing violence and were not feeling that they had particularly strong relationships. Um, and then we also found that women's reproductive desires were not being met. So when we asked women right at the baseline, when we recruited them right after they were married, um, what their desires were for their fertility, most said that they desired only two children. Um, about 8.5% had already gotten pregnant. Most said they didn't want children right away, that they wanted to wait two or more years. About 30% said that it would be inconvenient to have a child now. And yet 18 months later, the vast majority of them have gotten pregnant. So we really saw this as indicating that, you know, women's had a desire to have a different life than they were having, right? And that, that to us suggested that, you know, we want to do something to try to help women be able to meet their goals. So in our qualitative work, we also found that the desire to delay the first birth was high. And this was true not just among the newly married women, but also among their husbands. So, you know, there's sort of this norm in the field that's working in reproductive health, especially in South Asia, that, you know, we're going to really focus on postpartum family planning and helping women space and limit births, but that, you know, this, the first birth can't be touched. There's like such a cultural norm to have that first baby soon that there's like not a lot of efforts focused on providing family planning services to newly married women. And yet we found that women really wanted to delay that first birth. And that husbands are also interested in that. So we can, this is a quote from a husband saying, I feel we should become responsible first. I want to wait. I started to work and learning new things. My wife is also new to this family and learning things. So there's a lot of talk among the couples of wanting to get to know each other, wanting to build that before jumping into parenting together. Um, we also heard couples talk about, especially the role of economics as a, both a hindrance to having a baby right away, but also that if women could delay the first birth, that might provide her more opportunities to engage in economic um, you know, labor force participation or continue schooling. Despite this, there was little communication about childbearing. Um, you know, this is true outside of even newly married couples, I think, but almost half hadn't discussed how many children they wanted to have with their husband early in marriage. One woman says, who should I talk with? My husband's busy. I feel shy to talk to my mother-in-law. Um, so, you know, this was a common thread that couples hadn't had a chance to really start talking about these things. And then in terms of this pressure to bear children, we really found mixed findings. So, you know, people would talk about, I want to wait a year, but then there was this perception that, oh, but my parents really want me to have a baby. You know, my mother-in-law and father-in-law really want me to have a baby. So people were really balancing this, their own desire with this perception of what the norm and the expectation was in their community. So here's the husband saying, you know, my parents also want a grandchild and, you know, my wife will have someone to talk with. And what was really interesting is that we saw the mother-in-laws grappling. You know, I think mother-in-laws are often painted in this picture of being the people who are sort of like forcing the norms, the cultural norms, the pressure to bear children. And we found that from some of the mother-in-laws, but there was a number of mother-in-laws who had more mixed perspective. So here's one really just laying this all out. From one point of view, if she gets birth early, I can see my grandchildren. But if she gives birth late, her body will be mature and she will have strength. But if she gives birth early, she might not have enough strength in her body and it will be difficult. Um, but then it gets to the perception of the community norms, right? But if she does give birth late, then people will talk about her and think she's infertile, right? So people are really struggling with what they want for themselves, what they want for their children, and then what they think society wants from them. And as you might expect, family planning was was fairly low. So Porter had used a family planning method. Most of it was the husband knew and said it was a joint decision. Um, and here's one woman saying, I would forgive birth after one and a half to two years, but I'm 18, what would I do? But my husband wants a child. So there was some conflict between partners also. Um, and another one saying, my husband doesn't know about my perceptions. I told him to buy condoms so he feels shy. Um, and so 
you can see that you know we have both some conflict, disagreement, discordance between couples on their desires, but also lack of knowledge and awareness or accessibility, comfort to accessing um, methods. So we also found relatively poor mental health, as you might expect from seeing some of those initial statistics about intimate partner violence, a couple of relationships, so high rates of women reporting a number of um, poor mental health outcomes, and it got worse over time. And we found that some of these sort of practices, these uh, that are kind of show that are markers of women's low status in their households, like eating last, was associated with poor mental health. You know, I think sometimes I face when I'm presenting on some of the super, like, oh, well, these are just, you know, cultural practices. It doesn't make women feel bad. But, you know, what we really found is like, no, like, you know, women who were having to live these experiences of these gender norms and behaviors, it impacted their mental health outcomes. Um, and that marital relationship quality was also associated with uh, mental health. So we were really interested in, okay, so we know that women have low status early in marriage, but how does this change, right? And I think the idea is, is like, oh, she gives birth and that's going to improve women's status. So we tried to look at that in some of our analysis. So first we looked at the outcome of intimate partner violence. So does giving birth reduce intimate partner violence? Does, do women who have a baby, are they treated better and experience less violence? And um, we found the reverse, actually, to our surprise. So we found that Pregnancy increased the odds of women experiencing intimate partner violence. So, from this measure of empowerment, this was not the didn't suggest that birth was protective. And then we also looked at um, access to food and nutrition. So, do women after they give birth do they have more access to um, you know that greater dietary diversity? Are they less likely to be less uh, last in the household? So, we found that becoming pregnant and working outside the home. Did increase dietary diversity, so there was that was good news. Um, but this was only true for women who lived in food secure households, and it wasn't sustained into the postpartum period. So we really saw this as maybe saying that our programs that are telling families that they should feed their pregnant wives are working, but once they give birth and they're not pregnant anymore, it doesn't seem to be that that messaging is like sustained and that households are continuing to provide you know high quality dietary diversity to women in the postpartum period. Um, and we also found that giving birth was associated with women being more likely to eat last in food insecure households. So here we really saw the intersection of some of those broader socioeconomic food insecurity factors, and those were interacting with um, with these changes in status um, to and how that impacted women's access to nutrition. So with all this in mind, after all these few years of research, um, we went through a very in-depth process of by analyzing this and discussing this with our research partners in Nepal, my OPI in Nepal, and then also a community organization we worked very closely with, and we designed an intervention. Um, and the goal was to provide healthy and health information on reproductive and maternal health, but it was really to work on building relationships and improving women's status in the household um, and to address individual, household, and community level norms. So what we did is we it was a four month weekly group intervention and it brought together households, triads together in a group. So basically newly married women and husband and mother-in-law from different households all came together with other newly married women, husbands and mother-in-laws from other households. So this was our way of getting it. Individual norms, household norms and community norms all together. Um, and we piloted it with 30 households. This was just a small pilot. Um, so there was 90 participants. These are the topics we covered. Um, but really each session was very interactive. You know, there were games, people were running races, you know, people were, we did little activities like they'd be in groups and they'd get 10 oranges. And, you know, you pretend that each person in the group was, one was a mother-in-law and a father-in-law and a boy child and a girl child and the new married women. And you'd say, distribute the oranges. And then they'd like take away half the oranges and be like, now distribute the oranges. You know, really trying to get people to think about, you know, how how things are happening in, in their households and, you know, what they're sort of, behaviors are and norms are. And we, you know, we did a lot of um, activities like helping to really, especially like um, engage the mother-in-laws because, you know, that's, a, it was very interesting to hear the uh, responses from the mother-in-laws who really aren't often engaged in a lot of interventions. And so, you know, we had the mother-in-laws tell their, the other people in the group about what it was like when they were a newly married woman, you know, and sort of like go through that process of like sharing and reflecting on their own experiences and um, how that was similar or different. So this was kind of our conceptual model about how the intervention would improve couple and household relationships. 
help improve women's status, help people meet their reproductive goals, and then also, you know, impact all these other factors like intimate partner violence, mental health, which ultimately both would improve pregnancy and health outcomes for women and children, but also have longer term impacts on women's empowerment. So here's a little bit about our finance. So again, this was a pilot. Um, and I want to acknowledge Ashley Mitchell, who did a lot of the uh, analysis of this data. Um, so we found significant differences um, from baseline to endline for basically all household members in terms of their knowledge about, this is about family planning related, abortion um, related questions. Um, here's a quote from a woman, you know, now we've been using condoms to plan for a baby. Earlier, we, husband and wife, never used to talk openly, but it's changed. We talk openly, love is, and care has increased. And, um, you know, my in-laws also say the same. Um, and there was an increase in the proportion of women who reported that they were likely to use contraception in the future, um, comparing baseline to endline. We saw a big impact in the qualitative work on norms about timing of the birth pregnancy. So here's a woman saying, you know, my mother-in-law had an old way of thinking. She used to tell me to have a childbirth right after marriage, but after the program, she tells me to have a baby after I complete my studies and get a good job. I'm happy to see this change. A husband's talking about how, you know, I don't think they should force anyone to give birth. It's completely the husband and wife's decision. We shouldn't be under anyone's influence. This quote from a mother-in-law, I wish my daughter-in-law to study more and their future should be good. There's time for them to bear a child. They're still young. They can do it later. It's better that they said and give birth. So, you know, these are really different than some of sort of the perceptions that we were seeing um, in our initial phase of research. We also saw impacts on norms about spacing of pregnancies, family size, and sex preferences. So, um, a mother in law saying it doesn't matter if it's a son or daughter. In our time, we used to have babies until a son is born. Um, today's daughter in laws don't have to wait to have a son. Then another mother-in-law is talking about the number of children, so it's better that they decide as per the wish of the husband and wife instead of other people saying this. And we asked this question in the survey data about their about specifically the using contraception to at all, but then using contraception to avoid or delay the first birth. And you know, these were small samples. It wasn't quite the second question is really what we were interested in, like, you know this idea of like needing to have a birth soon after marriage, you know, and can we, how can we shift that norm? And so it seems like maybe there was some shift in that norm, even though it wasn't statistically significant. Um, but we were, we were pleased to see the direction that a lot of these were changing in. Um, we have a lot of folks just talking about changes in the household dynamics and decision-making. So here's a husband saying, you know, women should be part of decision-making. They can contribute in many ways. Everyone should be respected and treated well. We should listen to female members of the family and take their opinion into it in any important matter. And newly married women, you know, people used to say the daughter-in-law is not a poor family member, but nowadays people say that son and daughter-in-law are equal. They support and respect them. And then a the mother-in-law saying, these days when decisions are made, they ask for suggestions of the women. So we were really happy. You know, I think that we were, we were really... A lot of what we were really testing was the mother-in-law <laughs> engagement because, you know, I think that a lot of interventions focus a lot on women, more include husbands, but sort of thinking about like how to engage this other important decision maker in this, in this setting um, and whether they would come to the groups, whether they would be open to being in a place with their daughter-in-law and son and, and, you know, other, and they were, the, they were really engaged and excited. And some of the quotes, which aren't here, you know, they talked about how like, you know, I, I, no one ever had engaged me in anything. And I got to go out in the community with my son and daughter in law. And people would be like, wow, like, that's so cool that you're walking around. And, you know, they, now I can ask them questions when I don't know something. And before I had no, and it was like very, I feel like their empowerment feeling of like what this provided them in terms of this opportunity was in some ways even like more powerful than um, for the newly married women and husbands. So, some of our findings on nutrition, we saw an increase in people's knowledge about who might need to eat more than other people in the household. Um, and we saw a shift in eating patterns with a decline in the number of daughter-in-laws reporting that they eat last. Um, just a couple last quotes. I think this is the last one. So here's a quote from a woman. I used to hear that to prevent unborn, baby, unborn babies from gaining weight, pregnant mothers should be prevented from eating nutritious food and iron tablets. 
but we came to know these aren't true and I've been implementing these in my life. Uh, and then a husband talking about how his wife, a number of them did, all, did get pregnant during the course of this, which we, we want them to be meeting their fertility desires. So this was expected. And we did include information about pregnancy, nutrition and care seeking as well. So a husband talking about how the, his mother and wife are establishing a relationship, eating nutritious foods, um, and then list all of those off. So just in summary, um, we found that many newly married women and also their husbands weren't having their desires about fertility or their life goals met. Um, the women do have low status early in marriage, but giving birth wasn't like any, wasn't a, a key, you know, factor that was going to like change the trajectory of what was going on broadly for her. This prevailing assumption about the desires for early childbearing was like, could not be moved and changed, really didn't seem to be holding up in a changing world where there's more opportunities for women and couples and families and like, you know, different visions for the future. And this even was true for the mother-in-laws and husbands. And, you know, we were really excited about the findings from our pilot that bringing these newly married couples and their mother-in-laws together with other people in their community was feasible and acceptable and like, enjoyable and welcomed. And it did seem to lead to some changes in knowledge and norms and behaviors. So I just want to spend like two slides talking about some new projects I have because this one's done. <laughs> but I know for those of you continuing on here or in the next year, if you're interested in hearing about any more of those, I have three new projects that are starting in India um, on these topics. So the first is an RCT to evaluate the effectiveness of a group and health intervention for postpartum women. So I had a small grant, and this is with my colleague Allison Aliotti. Um, where we did a kind of iterative human-centered process to design this intervention for women in the postpartum period where like the newly married period, there's limited mobility and you know, women can't leave the home both because it's hard to do that with the baby, but also there are some certain cultural restrictions on leaving the home post-pregnancy. Um, and then also just broadly, women have limited mobility. So the idea was, can we provide something to women in their homes that gives them more than just health information, but that also provides some kind of sense of like support. So it's a group call um, that women participate in every week for six months postpartum. And it, there's a, a call, which we actually ended up doing over Zoom. Um, and then there's also like a WhatsApp um, group where they can talk to each other. And there's like a health provider involved who can help moderate and answer questions. And then there's um, an app. And then we also had um, IDR and active voice recording messages that for women who didn't have the ability to use an app because of either literacy or smartphone access. So we are testing that um, on the main outcomes are breastfeeding, family planning, and postpartum depression. And then also with uh, my colleague Allison Eliotti, we have another R1 in India where we're looking at a phenomenon of women migrating during pregnancy. So um, this I think is pretty common in a lot of places where women return to their mom's home when they're pregnant and for delivery and into the postpartum. And, you know, all of my colleagues in India, they're like, oh yeah, of course, everyone does that. You know, but there's actually, if you look in the literature, there's not even really a name for it or a description of what the drivers are. And of course, like how that impacts health outcomes is what we're interested in, you know, thinking about the continuum of care and the idea that women are connected to a healthcare worker in their community that helps encourage them to deliver at that facility in their community. And then that they're in that same system for follow-up care, you know, if women are going to another village, which might be in a different district or even a different state, what's happening to that continuum of care and what does that mean for women's health? Um, so this is not an intervention, it's just a longitudinal study where we're going to follow women in the postpartum period across three different states of India and understand like, what are the drivers of migration? What does it look like? And then what does it do for women's and maternal uh, infant health outcomes? And the last one is a project I'm really excited about, which kind of stems from some of the ideas that came out of the project I just talked to you guys about, um, which was really hearing newly married women say that they wanted something more <laughs> in their life. And a lot of one thing I didn't talk about is a couple of women at, in the interviews were sort of like, you know, we all, we get education now, right? Women's education is like, increase a lot um, in the settings that I'm working in at least and you know they're like we go to school and then we get married and we can't do anything with it you know and they kind of this like this they had their aspirations their hopes what they wanted to do they felt like they could do something but then they didn't feel like they had any opportunities to 
translate that into to doing something more. Um, and so, and a lot of them said that, you know, we just wish we had some kind of skill, you know, like sewing or something that we could, and, you know, understood a little bit more about money. And so the idea of this is to, we part, are partnering with an NGO in Budaipur, which is a lovely place to go, um, and um, to look who is providing sort of like life skills and some basic like finance and bank banking skills to groups of newly married women. And then we're going to look at follow those women for two years and see if it's associated with their ability to avoid an unintended pregnancy or plan their pregnancy with whatever they want and also a host of other health and empowerment related outcomes. So those are all just starting now and happy to talk to anyone about those. <laughs> or Yes, so that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Diamond Snape, um, both uh, Jasmine Han and I have uh, reviewed the slide deck a couple of days ago and have uh, many provocative questions for you. <laughs> and hopefully uh, we will also hear from the audience. But if you want to go first. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really interesting, actually, when I was reviewing the intervention, and um, I was just wondering if you mentioned that um, the inter there was a qualitative phase with triadic in-depth interviews and how it included newly married women and their husbands and uh, the mother-in-law, and I was wondering what the role of the father-in-law was in that intervention and if there was a role for him. That's a great question. Great question. Um, so one of the things that came out, this isn't exactly answering your question, but at the end of the intervention, when we were doing qualitative interviews with the mother-in-laws and women and husbands who participated, a number of them were like, well, why didn't you involve the father-in-law? <laughs> so um, I think that there, you know, at a certain point, yeah, so maybe a household intervention that was inclusive of mother-in-laws and father-in-laws would be a good approach. And I think, you know, I think there's sort of, I think the mother-in-law is often more engaged and seen as like a big decision maker in the daughter-in-law issues. But I think the father-in-law is a decision maker. There was a lot of talk also about alcoholism um, in the communities that we were working in and especially among the father-in-laws that came, the other household members talked about that in the qualitative and so I think that's one thing that we've been thinking about is it's actually been coming up in a lot of my work um, is alcohol and especially among men and how that's affecting a lot of the things that I'm researching. So I think there's a need to be thinking bigger about all the different factors that are influencing women's health. Um, so in this study, there were um, metrics of around uh, contraception, 24% have ever used family planning, but can you explain a little more what kind of contraceptives were available and what kind of contraceptives were actually used? Because this, I, I saw condoms, but that is not... It's pretty much all condoms, yeah. It's pretty much all... I mean, so family planning is available free of charge at public facilities in Nepal. So there shouldn't be, and there's also community health workers that outreach into communities and provide some methods like family, like condoms. Um, so there shouldn't be cost or access barriers to getting any type of method, <laughs> it, you know, but obviously condoms aren't the necessarily the most effective or long-term method. So I think that, um, there's definitely space for improving the method mix. And I think one of the things we focused on was like increasing awareness about different options. You know, I think, I don't know if any of you have studied family planning, but I think that um, fears of infertility 
and side effects and misperceptions sort of about impacts of family planning, I think are especially salient for young people who haven't done their childbearing yet. So my guess would be, and some of my previous work has suggested that that's a big barrier to using other types of family plan, hormonal types of family planning methods. Um, but in, yes, for our, this population, it was basically the only thing anyone had used was condoms. Um, during the weekly sessions, how interactive were those sessions? And like, what did the conversations like revolve around? Um, and we also noticed that there were like pamphlets in some of the slides. So were, the, were those pamphlets mainly like educational materials around like women's reproductive health or what information were in those pamphlets and other educational materials? Yeah, so the I think this I think the sessions differed by the moderator a little bit as with, you know, I think it's it's really interesting doing this type of research for those of you thinking, you know, behavioral interventions like this, you know, it's very different than giving somebody a pill or a shot. You know, it's it, understanding what actually happens when this intervention you spend so long, so carefully designing in this iterative process, you know, that was like weeks long work with the, our community partners, you know, what actually happens in the field is hard to know. <laughs> and I think at a certain point you have to just, you know, you, you make a very detailed um, like manual and you do a lot of training and you, you know, try to have supervision and those type of things. But at a certain point, you know, each, each part, each moderator is going to be different and you want it to be reflective of the needs of a group and the dynamics of a group. So you also want there to be some heterogeneity, but it does make it hard to fully understand and know like, oh, was one group just like done better or done differently? Or was there something that happened here? But I, I think, so I didn't get into this, but in our pilot, half of the communities were in like a slightly more rural and half were more in like a semi-urban part of pretty rural Nepal. So it's not like a huge, you know, it's not like close to Kathmandu or anything, but I got the sense that the ones in the rural community were like a little harder to bring people out and get them to really share. But I think over time, like that's why we had it so long. I got a lot of feedback, like, oh my gosh, this is so long. <laughs> like no one's gonna engage in this group thing for four months. But I think that that was key because what we were trying to do was strengthen relationships and break down barriers. And um, so, I, and I think it really worked. Like nobody was like, the intervention was too long. Everyone was like, this should keep going. Why don't you keep offering this to us? So I think people, yeah, I think that with time, you know, people probably got more comfortable, but I wasn't there. As you could see from the pictures, it happened during COVID, which was amazing. You know, everyone was wearing masks in there. So, um, yeah. Um, I just had a quick, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very helpful. Um, I think that um, women's social status and gender norms is something that I think about a lot and as well. And so kind of deeply entrenched in like community and culture. Um, I was wondering, um, like, what do you think about like the interventions? Was there like a teaching component or uh, some kind of facilitation or which component of the discussions and the exchanges did you think had an impact on later like improving um, some of the conceptions because, um, yeah, it just can be hard to like uh, you know, stop it from kind of perpetuating in a way if there's already um, idea ideas about, um, you know, women's social status or responsibility. So I was curious about the intervention that would have come. Yeah, so I think you're asking, well, I'm going to answer a couple of things because you brought a couple of great points. Um, so one question is what really did the intervention entail, which is such a great question. So I don't know my experience in starting to design this and do my research, you know, when I was writing the grant eight or longer years ago, and you look at what, what people, what are the interventions people have done? And you read research papers and so infrequently does anyone actually tell you what they did? Like they're like, oh, this intervention, it had this many groups for this many time and there's this many sessions and we covered these topics. Like they, what I showed you there, but that doesn't tell you very much. Like how much of it was interactive? Like, what were those interactive things? Like, what really were the topics that you talked about? So when we were working on our paper, our main paper from this, I had like a huge fight with the journal to increase, because I think part of it is like journal word limits. You know, and I went through all these and, you know, colleagues and students who were working with me, you know, we would like write to the people who published it and be like, will you just share with us what 
your actual like sessions or your mod, like your manual, because like why reinvent the wheel if someone showed that something worked or what can we learn from or if there are certain topics and it was very hard to do that. I, some people were willing to do that. Anyways, so we fought with the journal and got extra word lengths to try to like provide a little bit more about what the intervention actually was and like actually what the process was of designing it and like why we chose the different components that we did. Um, but I think that that's hard to be able to do. And I don't know, maybe there's like reports or something where there's people are able to do that better. But I think it's like a limitation in our field, especially for complicated behavioral interventions like this, that like there's not a great way to actually know what people really did um, for interventions like this. To your question about what component actually worked, well, that's like two R01s from now, I think. <laughs> then I'll figure that out. Um, you know, so I think that like the next phase, like this was a small pilot, right? The next phase is to test this in a larger population where we are actually following women over time and are powered to actually look at the effect, right? So that'll be sort of like your effectiveness study. And then I think after that, you can like do something where you can like break apart the different components and try to understand better. Like, oh, if we, like, do we need to involve the households with other groups? Like, or is it the group component that's the most important? Is it, you know, that you just provide them information? Like maybe we don't have to try to build relationships and have them play games. Like what is it that makes a difference? So I think that TBD, um, but I'm also interested to know about that. It's a question from Dr. Walker. Also known as Dillis, thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much, Nadia. It's really great to just see and get a glimpse of your journey because this, the, you know, she talks about it as this smooth journey, but it's so much work and slogging through the past five, eight years that to get to this point is huge and really commendable. So congratulations. I was really struck by the mental health indicators in that pilot and really clearly marriage doesn't make things better for these women. Um, so I'm curious, one, from their non-married status to their married status, does that improve their mental health? Is there anything good about getting married for their well-being for their mental health? Because from there on, it gets worse. You didn't report, you didn't share anything about the mental health outcomes, which I was curious about because it's that seems like such a big red flag to me. And then in your other R01 where you're looking at migration to natal home, it for me, it seems like a huge part of that is the mental health and support. And I'm just curious how you're seeing maternal mental health, which is one of these topics that is really beginning to be better understood. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer your first, your second question first. Um, so yes, I think we framed the grant as, oh my gosh, the continuum of care is gonna be broken, that's gonna be terrible. But I think it's the opposite. And actually it's kind of alarming that the continuum of care being broken isn't a problem. And Instead, it seems like returning to your natal home is those women do better and have better birth outcomes and get more prenatal visits and more likely to deliver in a facility. I mean, more likely to get postpartum care. But we're trying to, there's also a selection factor into who goes to their mom's home, right? So that's, I think, what we're hoping to really understand with this study more about like who's going, why are they going, you know, and then how that impacts maternal health outcomes. But yes, I think that women go home because their moms will not make them go back to work 24 hours late. You know, and so many of, for this study, at the end of the interview, our research assistants told us when like the very first time I went there, like at the end of the interview, all the women want to know how not to get a C-section because their mother-in-law has told them they can't get a C-section because they have to go back to work. So they were just like, what do I do? And, you know, and so I think there's this extreme pressure for women to not get a lot of rest postpartum. And so I think that going to your mom's home, you get that. And that's one of the main drivers and more support and more care for the baby and all these things. So in terms of mental health, yeah, we were shocked. I mean, I think it's just, you know, these women enter pregnancy and right away things, you know, we would hope that you can see it being very scary to enter into a relationship, a new household with people you don't know. And these are mostly arranged marriages. Like that would be a really hard time. But I think what was scary was just how quickly it seemed to get bad. So I'm, I'm, I think, I'm glad to see that there's a movement and more people looking at global mental health issues, you know, and outside of just postpartum depression, you know, it thinking about mental health and how that impacts health outcomes across women's life course. 
That's very impressive, uh, Nadia. Free arrow one. Uh, congratulations. That is truly amazing. I have one last question for you, kind of provocative. Um, I learned that 16% of the newlywed women regretted being married after one year. What would be the proportion in the US? <laughs> This is not my area of expertise, but I saw a presentation once at PAA, which is the demographer conference, which is awesome, um, that looked at like marital happiness over the life course. And I think there was like, it, it was high. And then when people have children, it, it gets low and then it gets like better. And so maybe, maybe, you know, it's normal for it to be low and get worse as people enter as somebody with a five-year-old and three-year-old. I know about this. And, um, but, you know, hoping it gets better over time. I don't know. I, it would be interesting, right? We need more longitudinal studies that look at this. Yeah, more research, right? Great answer. The question came from someone who's been married 48 years. So I can tell you about that. Uh, please join me in thanking Dr. Nadia.